Welcome to Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, which is a production of Politics in Motion. Uh, this week, uh, I want to talk about some strange feelings I've been having about the situation in the world right now. And I'm going to make some guesses and some intuitive leaps and so on, but I think these are posing in my mind a whole set of questions which I think, if we consider them further, might help us grapple with the situation as it is right now and hopefully do something about it. I'm working with here is the following. Does history repeat itself? And if so, with what consequences and how? Now this idea of history repeating itself has a famous articulation in uh, a text by Marx uh, on uh, the 18th Brumaire in which uh, Marx talked about uh, the, what was happening in France in the 1850s. And one of the things he said was, uh, indeed, if history repeats itself, then it does so the first time as tragedy and the second time as farce. Now, this is a sort of a well-known saying by Marx, and like all of Marx's one-liners, it has a certain truth to it, but it also has, I think, some deep defects if we treat it as uh, the, law of the uh, law of history. Uh, in this case, uh, the reason that Marx used this kind of commentary was he was pouring scorn upon the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, a man called Louis Bonaparte, who had just got uh, elected president of France and was clearly wanting to create a second version of the famous empire of Napoleon I and do so by uh, actually calling himself uh, uh, the Emperor of France. And so in 1852, he declared himself Emperor. By then, Marx had already written this text, but he was kind of saying, this is a pretty farcical rerun of the great Emperor, uh, Napoleon, of the Napoleonic Wars, and this is the nephew, a rather trivial character in Marx's view, who is taking a try, living, if you like, off the reputation of his uncle in order to create a, an imperial presence uh, in France and in the world. Now, if Marx had been writing this at the end of the Second Empire, he might have actually ended up saying, well, this is not a very appropriate way to look at it because the Second Empire ended in a disaster and uh, ended also in a sort of minor triumph because the Paris Commune, which came after the Second Empire, uh, was uh, one of the first major times when socialists actually ascended to, to state power and actually ran a commune uh, on that principle. It didn't last very long, it was beaten back by the bourgeois forces, uh, but nevertheless it was a mark-out point. So here is that this question then. And in thinking about it, I noticed uh, when I went back to one of the texts that I uh, actually enjoyed when I was uh, uh, sort of first getting into trying to understand a lot of this stuff. And it's a text by uh, Eric Fromm. And Eric Fromm was a, a psychiatrist, and, uh, but also a thinker in Germany connected uh, to very many, many left uh, causes. And uh, he was well read in, in Marx as well. But one of the things he does in this little book called uh, uh, Beyond the Chains of Illusion, My Encounters with Marx and Freud, was he, he poses the following problem, he says. It's got a, 
in an, an issue. The, somebody has had three marriages that has failed and is now contemplating a fourth. Uh, and in what sense would we say that it's almost certain that the fourth marriage will also fail? And uh, what Fromm does is to say, well, the answer depends, but it depends on whether or not the person concerned has grappled with the reasons why the first few marriages failed. And if uh, somebody then understands where that failure came from, they will be in a position uh, to maybe venture on another marriage, and this time uh, it would not be certain to fail. And Fromm used this as a pre precursor to thinking about the situation in Europe in uh, 1960, the text I'm talking about was published in 1960. And the big issue, I think, that uh, everybody at that time, late 1950s and 1960s, was in the back of everybody's mind is, we've had two world wars. There has, in, in a sense, been a, a repetition. And this repetition is not at all farcical. It ends up with uh, uh, nuclear weapons being utilized uh, uh, by the United States against, Jap against Japan. So, but nevertheless, there's a repetition here, and uh, there was a very great fear in the 1950s and 1960s that there would be another war, a third world war. So the question, which was sort of floating around in the air uh, when I first first becoming uh, sort of politically conscious about things, was in what sense might there be another world war, and if so, what would it be like? Uh, and that was animating a, 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 an issue about the use of nuclear weapons, so that in, for, for example, Britain, there was a, a big anti-nuclear campaign for nuclear disarmament, uh, and the CND organization was big, held big demonstrations, and was, there was a great nervousness about uh, that we might slip back into World War III, and if World War II was anything to go by, the non-farcical version would suggest that it would be a, a World War III would be about using nuclear weapons and now. So now we are in a situation where people are credibly thinking that we are not too far from World War III. In fact, some people, and I think I can consider myself to be of this part, for, for some people, uh, we already are in, if you like, the, the, the precursors to World War III the kind of the, the earth tremors that you feel when uh, people like Putin say, well, I might use nuclear weapons. The United States kind of says it's concerned about the potential use of, of, uh, uh, of nuclear weapons and, and, and so on. So this, this question is on the table right now. And the, then the question is, well, why is it that we've got ourselves to a point where World War III seems to be a possibility and that we therefore ought to already be taking evasive action. Now this uh, repetition is, is met by another repetition, and that is this, that in the whole history of uh, capitalism, uh, and uh, you know, since, uh, say, uh, 1800 or so, there have been two episodes when governance has effectively uh, gone to a, a dictatorial, authoritarian, uh, even fascistic uh, forms, and, and has done so in, in, a, in a very widespread ray, way. And you would look back and you would say, well, actually, if you take the period from, say, 1919 to 1939, uh, during the 1920s, uh, we see a lot of agitation and, and, and so on, and there's, a, and there's a big financial crash in 1929, followed by the Great Depression in the 1930s, um, which is then accompanied by the emergence of uh, fascist uh, dictators. Uh, Hitler, of course, in Germany, Mussolini and uh, Franco, and there were many smaller kind of versions of that, and there were even sort of people in the United States who were playing around with the idea that a fascist form of government uh, would be what was required in the United States to get out of the Great Depression. Uh, one of the people who felt that way was uh, Henry Ford, for example, 
And so it was not an uncommon thing in the 1930s to have uh, this question of having a much more authoritarian, dictatorial form of government, not necessarily fascist and anti-Semitic in the way that Hitler was, but uh, uh, certainly uh, fascistic in the sense that it was going to confront the economic and the political situation uh, in an open, open sort of way. And that was the situation in the 1930s. And then you say to yourself, to what degree are we in a similar situation now? And you look around and you, of course, well, okay, this Donald Trump, but Donald Trump is not an aberration. Donald Trump is just a bit of an outlier on what seems to be a global movement towards more authoritarian forms of governance, uh, far right and so on. So you have Maloney coming to power in Italy. Uh, you have uh, Millet coming to power in uh, Argentina. Uh, you look at some of the long-standing uh, dictatorial regimes, uh, for example, Erdogan in, in, in Turkey. Uh, you have now Modi in, in India. So uh, you, you, in effect, would kind of say, well, uh, fascistic, neo-fascistic, fascistic, alternative right forms of governance in terms of forms of new political parties like the capture of the Republican Party in the United States, uh, the uh, emergence of the alt-right alt par far party in, in Germany and so on. So here we have a situation uh, where there is in fact uh, a, a movement uh, which rather parallels that of the 1930s. And that is something then that uh, needs to be thought about and saying, well, you know, are we going through a repeat of the 1930s? And in the same way that 1930s led into the war, uh, is World War Three already brewing? Because in 1937 in Britain, uh, people started to talk openly of the possibility of a, uh, a global war. Uh, and uh, now we're beginning to see this, uh, that sort of talk emerging uh, around not only what's happening in Ukraine, but of course what's happening in uh, uh, Gaza and, uh, and so on. So here we have a situation where you might kind of say, look, there's something familiar, similar and familiar about the situation right now when you contrast it and, 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 and compare it uh, to the situation in the 1930s. So then you ask the question, which Fromm would ask, which is, well, if there is a likelihood of another world war, uh, in order to evade it, we have to come to terms with what it is that generated the first two world wars. What are the conditions which, which led into, uh, led into uh, this? And here there is another rather astounding and astonishing parallel. And that is this that in the same way that uh, we, we, we see the current uh, situation emerging out of a period of government austerity and neoliberal political ideology, so that is uh, the situation that's emerged since the 1980s uh, throughout much of the, the Western world. Uh, if you go back and you look and you say, well, what was the situation in the 1920s? Uh, you find a similar situation. The situation was uh, increasing austerity, and uh, the, that increasing austerity is creating situations in which uh, there is a great deal of uh, political difficulty and political uh, turmoil, and out of that political turmoil is, is emerging sort of a, a strongman politics. So I started to think a lot about the whole kind of question of austerity, and there are some a couple of good books that have come out recently on austerity, one by uh, Clara Maté uh, about austerity and fascism, and uh, I think this is a very important book. Also, Mark Blythe had a, a rather good book on uh, the problems of austerity. Now, why do we have austerity? Uh, and this is, is uh, if you like, uh, what, what the big economists are really talking about, and the question arises as to uh, you know, where, does, where does political policy come from and what was happening to capitalism uh, during the 1920s and 1930s and what has been happening to capitalism during the 1980s, 1990s, right the way through to now. So if we kind of do this, this comparison, you would say the issue of austerity lies absolutely central, and central in, 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 a, double, in a double sense. 
First off, if governments are engaging in austerity, what they're in effect doing is saying that we cannot actually find the, 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 uh, the economic means to uh, deal with the needs of the population and to the degree that the population is creating demands, we basically have to put those demands uh, to one side and, and, and put the social movements that are making them uh, have to be put down and have to be stopped. So in other words, any kind of socialist kind of thing and say that we should have a state that meets people's needs. Um, what we hear the state saying in the 1930s and saying right now is, you know, we would love to meet your needs, but we don't have the ability to do so. And in fact, the economy demands a politics of austerity. Now, that word austerity is interesting. It comes from the word austere. And austere politics is very, very hard-nosed, tough love kind of politics. In other words, uh, it's not as if people are going to be happy with a, with a compassionate state. You're not going to find a compassionate state anywhere. I defy you to find a compassionate state anywhere in the world right now. Uh, in fact, they're all of them kind of saying basically the same thing. Uh, you know, if we forget compassion, we give you know, tough luck on you. Um, you've got to uh, take it. Um, uh, and, and actually, this even applies in China. I was astonished to see that, well, uh, you know, China's going through a, a certain phase of, uh, of austerity. And when, when uh, Xi Jinping was asked uh, what to dare say to youths about, uh, and uh, his, his, his comment was, learn to eat bitter food. Uh, in, in, other words, in other words, you know, you're on your own, you've got to find your own way, and you're not likely to find very much, and you're going to just have to learn to eat bitterness. And, and you, and, but when you do that to a population, you create a very discontented population. So here too, also, I will look at the massive discontents that existed in the 1920s and 1930s, and the discontents that have been arising uh, steadily, in effect, since the year 2000, become um, articulated in a much stronger kind of way. So there is a discontented population, an angry population, a, a population that feels unloved. And I think this whole kind of question of, you know, to what degree is a population loved by its rulers and, and in a compassionate way uh, disappears entirely during phases of austerity. Uh, there have been phases, uh, and you know, there were phases in the 1960s, I say, when in Britain they started to have a good national health service, in France the same thing, uh, so that the, the state could be seen as serving the needs of the people. Uh, but then when Margaret Thatcher came along, no longer is the state going to meet, meet the needs of the people. If the people have needs, then they have to go to the NGOs. Now, there's a big difference between being a citizen and going to a state and saying, I have rights, you have to do this for me. Take more money out of the rich classes and pass them on to me. Uh, you know, so when, when you have that structure, it's very different from a situation where social services are provided by NGOs. NGOs are, are charities. And in effect, you have to go no longer as a citizen demanding something, but you go as a beggar uh, uh, pleading for something. Please help me. Please try and set up some programs uh, so that I get adequate food, I get adequate, adequate uh, uh, shelter, I get adequate clothing, ed adequate education. It all starts to become uh, a, a charitable organization. And notice what that, that does to the psychology of the population. As a citizen, you feel you have, any, uh, you have rights and possibilities and you can go out and fight for them. We can't, it's difficult to fight with an NGO. If you fight with an NGO, you simply lose what you've got. So, so, so it's a completely different kind of sensibility. One is rather humiliating, uh, right? And the other is actually self-affirming. But then we're told that in order to self-affirm, this is Margaret Thatcher's famous bleat, in order to self-affirm, we have to become entrepreneurial, as, uh, entrepreneurial persons of the, st of the self. That is, you have to make yourself. And you make yourself, and, it, it, and, and if you're poor, it's because you have not done enough work making yourself. So you blame the victim. So, in other words, the state takes no responsibility. The state doesn't do anything or very much. And, and so we get a situation where the population becomes totally alienated from the state. 
And being alienated from the state means that there are a lot of people out there who are discontent, who want, you know, they're, they're, they're experiencing, you know, uh, drink bitter tea uh, uh, or, uh, and so on. You're, you're experiencing that and you're not getting, getting very much in the way of satisfaction. So if you look at the, the situation in the United States right now, you would say, you know, it's, it's surprising. I mean, there was a kind of reaffirmation of state power during COVID, lopsided because under, under Trump it went one way and after, under Biden it went another way, where, where people began to get some stuff. But on the other hand, they are now in this alienated situation in which they are alienated from the state, they dislike the state, they don't trust the state, and, and so the, the, then, then we have uh, a, 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 a situation where it's very easy uh, for what I would call a narcissistic politics to take care. In other words, if, if, if the only kind of love you have is tough love, uh, you may as well love yourself uh, and be you know, narcissistic about it. And therefore, uh, you, what you do then is, is start to uh, really become enamored of uh, narcissistic politicians. Trump is a very, very good example of this, uh, hugely narcissistic, promises a population tough love and love and all these kinds of things, and, and people fall, fall for it. The same thing was true for, of what happened with Mussolini. Mussolini went from a kind of a socialist background in the 1910s and this kind of thing, and then kind of said, you know, uh, we even need a situation where we've got to you know, you know, exercise tough love and, and we've got to be, you know, have authority and use authority and discipline and all this kind of stuff. Now, you put that together and say, you know, there's a widespread narcissistic politics around. Uh, there is austerity. And austerity came very strong in Britain in, in the 1920s uh, and, and, and then it spread uh, to the United States and elsewhere uh, in the 1930s. And so uh, that austerity has, has consequences. Uh, one of the consequences the austerity had in Britain was uh, Britain, the, the British uh, uh, Navy uh, laid off uh, or, or a lot of the, the workers in, in, in the shipyards so because uh, they, you know, they said the government didn't have the money to, 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 to pay for them. My father was unemployed for four or five years in 1930s as a shipyard worker. He only went back in 1937 when it seemed that war was imminent and that therefore you would need somebody to take care of the ships uh, during the war. So, so this, this world has, has, has these consequences. So one of, the, one of the things that I'm concluding here is this, that, that the, the configuration of things is such uh, that it's very dangerous, extremely dangerous, and that World War III could easily come out of the fact that all of these petty dictators and plutocrats and so on are milling around uh, with a great deal of power uh, and uh, living a good life for them, whereas the rest of the population are actually suffering from tough love, de depleted uh, uh, social uh, reserve uh, 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 forces. All of these things uh, are going, going, going badly. And when things go badly, uh, then what happens is that you start to get the kind of the articulation of, uh, of an angry politics uh, of, of often a violent politics uh, domestically and a violent politics in terms of international relations. And you begin to see right now, look at the violence of the rhetoric in the United States about China. Now, I'm not going to pretend that China is China's a, saint, a saintly people or anything like that, but you have to say that the uh, un, un, unwarranted accusations that are made against China, left, right and centre, and the blaming of China for almost everything uh, is creating a situation of uh, geopolitical tension uh, in which uh, also there starts to become a whole kind of question of, uh, uh, of territory and so on. And so, you, you know, Putin and Ukraine, uh, the question of Taiwan and so on starts to become, become significant. So here I, here, here I would just, just, just ask this question. If there are certain signs of repetition 
uh, around us of the, 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 what happened in the 1930s and, and will we you know, in say 20 or 30 years time sort of look back and say my god you know the, the year 2020 and so on well, was the year where we actually went back into a kind of politics of the 1930s and that was if you like the beginnings and the, the, of, of the situation of World War, World War III. Now these are these are all kind of kind of surmises and guesses on my part, but on the other hand, when I look at the the the, the, the data and I look at austerity politics when it is applied and how, how it is applied, I would want to say that that austerity politics, coupled with uh, many of these other kind of elements of humiliation and so on. Uh, through the kind of way in which social services and so on are delivered. All of these issues uh, are, are, are adding fuel uh, to the flames that could e easily explode. And of course this time if they explode, uh, they're likely to involve an, an exchange of nuclear uh, weapons. And, and that is something where, you know, as a socialist I would say to myself, I would want to militate right now for a socialist future. But right now, I am actually concerned that the socialist future will disappear entirely in the wake of a nuclear exchange. So in other words, I'm kind of saying we've got to stop every possible way we can this possible repetition of the kind of politics and of the kind of warlike engagements that we, which occurred in the 1930s. So it's well worthwhile, I think, to just do some thinking about and wondering about uh, what that repetition might look like. And it certainly will not be farcical. It will be uh, apop apocalyptic uh, if, uh, if, it, if it occurs. And as I say, I think in my own, in my own sense, my own intuition would say, I think we've seen the tremors of, well, of, of a future global war unless uh, big things happen to, to, to bring it to a halt.